This is a presentation of the University of Wisconsin Parkside. It's, it's okay now? All right. I am very pleased to be here. Thank you so much. I have never been on the campus of UW Parkside. Um, I'm one of those people who always just kind of goes past on 94. Uh, and um, so I've never turned off and uh, to see the campus and I would just love to come back sometime and walk your trails because I understand that it's just beautiful here in the springtime. Um, as Helen said, I teach at UW Oshkosh and I was just mentioning Oshkosh has the smallest footprint of any of the UW campuses. Uh, so I don't look out any windows at Oshkosh and see uh, woods and I got a little glimpse of that when I came here today, so that's so nice. I am um, very happy to be here with you. I um, appreciate Helen uh, and all the support staff who have put this afternoon together and um, I hope that um, you will find what I say uh, to be stimulating and get you thinking about some things. Um, I'm also uh, anticipating that we will have some time for discussion. Uh, so um, I'm gonna take my watch off and put it right here and remember to look at it every now and then uh, because um, I definitely wanna have some discussion. And, and um, Helen said that some of you may be here for another program. So um, what we'll try to do is to end this program at um, 5.15 uh, so that some of you can get to where you need to go, uh, but um, I'd be glad to stay and uh, speak personally with you, answer questions, whatever, uh, if you would like to do that. So here we go. So everybody's okay with sound, right? We can, everybody can hear? Okay, excellent. Um, so the topic today is uh, meaningful aging today and in the future, and here's how I want to start. I want to start with a story. Because human beings are storytellers, and we remember things best through stories. So here's the story. It was a phone call that I got, and I picked up the phone, I said hello, and the woman at the other end of the phone said, I've got a story for you. Well, it turns out that she's a woman that I had met at a Wisconsin Alzheimer's Association meeting just a couple of uh, months previously. And she was calling me rather urgently to tell me about an upsetting experience that she had just had. She's been caring for her husband, who has Alzheimer's disease, for about three years. Uh, and, um, you know, with the usual kinds of issues that uh, caregivers deal with, uh, but really uh, doing a pretty good job with everything, all things considered. But in this conversation, her story unfolded quickly. It was a story about bowling. She and her husband loved to bowl, and she had been looking for some kind of activity that they could do together. So she had signed them up for a mixed league. And everything had been going along quite well, and as a matter of fact, she said, her husband's a good bowler, and quote, he helps us win. Now sometimes, of course, he forgot that it was his turn and he got a little bit mixed up occasionally with how the scoring was going, but his body remembered how to bowl. But then there was this phone call. The manager of the bowling alley had just called her to say that one of the women in the league had called him and had asked to be put on another bowling league. This was a woman that my caller had considered to be a friend. As a matter of fact, this was a woman who was a member of her church and she had known her for a long time. But this woman had called the manager of the bowling alley to want to be transferred to another league with people who were normal. And what was even more upsetting to my caller was that this woman, again, someone she thought of as a friend, said that she wanted to switch leagues because people like my caller's husband, quote, 
sometimes forget they are married. My caller was justifiably hurt and angry. She said that she considered calling her priest to talk it over with him, but then she figured he'd deny it. What she wanted me to know is that the message isn't getting through. The message isn't getting through in the local community about how persons can continue to enjoy life and remain in community despite having memory loss and confusion. So I've heard a lot of stories like this, and perhaps you've heard stories like this too. They can be heartrending. They can be heartrending in the terms that get thrown around in the media and in the scientific literature are confusing, and the numbers are dizzying. And the topic elicits so much anxiety that some people say they would rather think about death. Here's what we're talking about. Now this is a really standard and rather iconic image at this point. This is, a, this is an image that shows population aging. It's what I sometimes refer to when talking with my students as the elephant in the python. The elephant moving through the python represents 78 million baby boomers who are aging. They were born between 1946 and 1964. And as they grew up, we had to build more schools for them. And then we had the 60s, and we all know about that. And then we had to, you know, college campuses like UW Parkside uh, in many ways sprang up in response to this cohort that now needed a college education, et cetera, et cetera. But now the elephant, the elephant has reached the part of the python we call aging, right? And in the year 2030, which is not all that far from now, one out of every five people in the United States, 20% are going to be 65 and older. One out of every five. I used to teach my classes. I started teaching about aging way back in the 70s. And, and I would put on the board the year 2000. You know, so it would be like 1977 or something. And, and I'd have the students subtract and figure out how many more years. And then I'd have the students figure out how old they would be in the year 2000. And, and, and you know, none of us could believe that that year was ever going to come. And here we are already in the year 2010. And, and likewise, this year 2030, which I sometimes call the demographer's touchstone, right? It's the, it's the year we've been projecting ahead to when one out of every five people in the United States will be 55 and older. 2030 isn't that far from now. It's just a mere 20 years away. So let's take another closer look at some of these numbers. Um, I want to show you some figures that are given by reputable organizations, figures that don't necessarily line up with each other. In 2008, the National Institutes on Aging in the United States estimated that between 2.4 and 4.5 million Americans have Alzheimer's disease. You know, that's kind of a big gap between 2.4 and 4.5. And in the same year, the Alzheimer's Association estimated that it wasn't, you know, 4.5, it was 5.2. And then the Alzheimer's Disease International Organization, which is a kind of umbrella group for Alzheimer's organizations, estimated that there were 30 million people worldwide who are living with dementia, and they projected that um, this number will rise to 100 million by the year 2050. What do we make of these numbers? Well, the first thing we can see is they don't agree with one another but they're big. So one question that always arises when we have discussions like this is, OK, how old is old? All right. So if we're projecting out that we're going to have this percentage of people with memory loss, 
Um, how old do you have to be? Well, according to the National Institute of Mental Health, 10% of all Americans 65 and older live with Alzheimer's disease. But that estimate increases to 50% of people 85 and older. 50%, one half, the estimate again from the NIMH, of persons 85 and older live with some form of dementia. And what we need to realize with this elephant in the python is that this group of individuals, 85 and older, is the fastest growing group of persons in the population, if you look at age, okay? So more people come into this group of 85 and older than babies are born, okay? It's the fastest growing group. And it is, of course, the group in our population that requires the most services and the group for which there is the highest probability of some kind of cognitive impairment. Now we have two studies I want to talk about. More numbers. These are studies that came out in 2007 and 2008. They're by a woman named Brenda Plassman and her colleagues at Duke University. They did a national study to try to figure out what percentage of persons in a certain age range have dementia. And so the first study that came out in 07 said that 13.9% of people 71 and older currently have dementia. And the next year, they came out with another study that was looking at something that we call mild cognitive impairment. And that estimate was that 22.2% .2 of people 71 and older have mild cognitive impairment. Now, I have to explain this mild cognitive impairment thing for you a moment. MCI, for abbreviation. It's quite controversial. There are a lot of clinicians, doctors, geriatric psychiatrists, neuropsychologists, etc., who believe that there is this category called MCI, which is characterized by memory problems, but no functional difficulties, so that people can continue to work and carry on their lives. It's just that they are starting to notice that they have memory problems. But I said it was controversial because some clinicians claim that this is one step on the path to Alzheimer's disease, and other clinicians claim, no, 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 it's not necessarily that at all, and as a matter of fact, you might get labeled as having mild cognitive impairment and go back a year later for tests and have improved in your memory, okay? So it's, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a shifting field out there in terms of MCI. However, if we take the Plasman data, right, we can uh, perhaps see, as a, a journalist named Rob Stein wrote in the Washington Post when this came out, he said that more than one-third of people 71 and older have some diminished mental function, more than one-third. And so I'd like to ask you what this means. What are the implications of this for how we live together in the 21st century as 78 million baby boomers are growing older? As a progressive condition that no therapy can yet reverse or prevent. Dementia's theft of memory, reason, and autonomy is terrifying to people. And it's especially terrifying when we distill the big numbers like this down to numbers we can handle, numbers in our local community. And so therefore, I would like you to imagine a high school reunion. I want you to imagine the 55th high school reunion of the class of 1966. That happens to be the year I graduated from high school. So this 55th reunion would be held in 2021, not that far from now. If 100 people attend that reunion, 
The research by Plasman and her colleagues predicts that at least a dozen of them will have been diagnosed with dementia, and another 20 or so will be heading toward dementia, having begun to show signs of memory troubles without experiencing trouble in daily functioning. So these men and women will be in their early 70s. Many will still be working. Many, if they're not working, will be volunteering in the community. They will have active, engaged lives. And so the question is, how are we going to create good communities for these persons? Because let me tell you, we are not going to be able to build a memory care facility on every corner of every block in the United States, right? We're not going to be able to do that. So what are we going to do? That's the point that I'm trying to challenge you to think about today. My talk today has two metaphors woven through it. Just like I like stories, I also like metaphors. They are metaphors of journeys, and they are metaphors of time. And the first one that I want to talk about is the metaphor of the journey of dementia. Now, the visual image that we often have, or at least those of us who deal with this in a professional way, the visual image that we have is is captured in graphs. You know, we social scientists like to take data and put it on graphs. And I'm about to show you a very famous graph that comes from the website of the National Institutes on Aging, and it gets reproduced in, oh, I've seen it reproduced in textbooks, I've seen it reproduced in talks and lots of different places. And here's what the graph looks like. <clears throat> now, some of you in the back might not be able to read this, so I'm going to kind of talk you through it. Um, it says, let's see if I can get the little button thing going on here. Well, yeah. yeah, never mind. At the top it says, charting the course of healthy aging, MCI, remember I just told you what MCI is, and AD, Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so notice how we have immediately begun by separating out healthy aging, MCI, and Alzheimer's disease. So with the assumption that MCI and Alzheimer's disease, well, they're unhealthy aging, I suppose. Um, so here we have the lifespan, okay, and we start with birth and we go to death, okay? Um, and, and, and you know, we're moving along just fine having our lives, children, teenagers, young adults, middle-aged adults, but whoops, somewhere in that time that there start to be a brain changes long before any symptoms show up. This is, a, this is a focus of a huge amount of research today to say, can we in some way capture uh, say for people in their 30s or 40s, who's going to develop Alzheimer's disease and who isn't because maybe then we can have an intervention or whatever. So, so these people who are going along with their lives, all is well, but certain changes may be starting to happen in their brains. Okay, so everything's going along just fine, just fine, just fine, until about age 55. And that says amnestic MCI, mild cognitive impairment. There are memory problems, like I just told you, but other cognitive functions are okay. Remember I said, you know, they're going about their daily lives, no problem. Um, but because the brain is compensating for changes, okay? So we've got this thing called reserve capacity and we're compensating for some changes. But look what then begins to happen. The two roads diverge and they never meet up again. And so the people who have this mild cognitive impairment, at least according to this graph from the National Institute of Aging, they begin this decline and they go through the green zone. Yeah, things are not quite right, but maybe not horrible yet. And then cognitive decline accelerates after they received the Alzheimer's disease diagnosis. And you could unpack that statement, but you can think about it. Um, and, and then we go into the red zone, and we get down here where it says total loss of independent function and death. 
Now, what I've always, I, I find many things fascinating about this graph, but one of the things I've always found really fascinating about it is that the people on the yellow road, okay, they're going along just fine, and, and you know, they start to have a little bit of decline starting around age 80, 85, but apparently they don't die. <laughs> So, this image of that the condition of the brain alone allows some people to age well, healthy aging, and others to age miserably, this idea is a relatively new idea. The metaphor of the human journey of the lifespan, however, has been around in Western history at least for a long time. And as this human journey of the lifespan has been portrayed by a friend of mine, a social historian named Thomas Cole, he talks about how once upon a time, this journey of the lifespan was envisioned as a spiritual pilgrimage. It was envisioned as a pilgrimage through life towards some communal ideals of transcendence. But starting in the late 19th century, the focus shifted to individual achievement and maintenance of individual identity. And those people who were never gifted with physical or mental health to begin with, or who lost it along the way, were seen to have failed the moral tests of adulthood and aging. And here's how Tom portrayed this idea in his book. It's a book called The Journey of Age. I highly recommend it. Here's another familiar metaphor. This is a metaphor of time. Whoops. Uh, maybe. I'm pressing the right button. Let me try that one. No. That one. OK. An hourglass. Right? We're all familiar with the hourglass. But the way Tom Cole presents this in his book is that in the 16th and 17th centuries, and, and on through the 18th and then getting a little thinner in the 19th, life was given meaning in a cosmic and a social way. Okay. Uh, but beginning in the 20th century, where we get this narrowing of the, of the uh, hourglass, Life now takes on meaning solely based on the individual. So meaning comes from my personal achievement, my personal brain power, my personal whatever. And, and, and we have become unmoored from social sources of meaning, um, not to mention cosmic sources of meaning. Is everybody clear about what that proposal is? Well, this, this, these metaphors I've been using, these metaphors of the journey through time, raise many questions for us. Who is on this journey with us? You all know that song, which I'm not going to sing. Uh, um, you got to walk through the lonesome valley. Got to walk. Oh, here I am singing. Uh, you got to walk it by yourself. Nobody else can walk it for you. You gotta walk it by yourself. You know that song? Okay, so is life really a lonesome valley? Okay, and do we really have to walk it by ourselves? Well, nobody else can walk it for us. Yeah, I understand that. But is it not possible to consider that other people could walk it with us? And those are some of the issues that I would like to deal with today. Can make this work? Yes, I can. These are the questions that I think we need to be posing. How can we remain in meaningful relationships with people we love in the face of mental decline and memory loss? How is friendship affected by forgetfulness? How can we deal with the fear and the anxiety we feel when we hear of people we cherish receiving the dementia diagnosis? And lastly, how can we create good communities 
for ourselves and our friends with memory loss? These are questions that I think we need to be asking today and that we are not really paying much attention to. Most of the empirical research on social relationships for persons with dementia is about family or paid caregivers. There is very, very little research that is done on friends. However, given the projected increase in cases that I just showed you, along with the proliferation of smaller and more complex family units, I think we are going to have to start paying more attention to friendships and community connections that have often been nurtured over the course of many, many decades. Will social stigma and personal fear sever these relationships? Or will people find courage to walk the dementia road with one another, perhaps discovering along the way a deeper sense of meaning and value in friendship and community? So thinking back to that telephone call I got, will people living with dementia be forced to bowl alone? Now some of you may know where I get that phrase, bowling alone. It comes from a very famous book that was written by a man named Robert Putnam. He wrote a book called Bowling Alone, and he was writing about how social relationships in the United States were coming unraveled to the extent that bowling leagues were falling apart and that if, uh, because you know, everybody's busy 24 seven, yada, yada, uh, and so if you wanted to bowl, you had to bowl alone. Now I don't bowl, uh, but this image has just really stuck with me. I think it's very powerful. Um, and, and Putnam was tracing this idea way back to the early part of the 19th century when a man named Alexis de Tocqueville, uh, a Frenchman, traveled all over the United States observing this new country. Some of you may have heard of de Tocqueville's work. So back in 1813, he was traveling all over the United States as it was then. And one of the things he observed time and again was that Americans love to get together in groups. Okay, we love to have clubs and social relationships and we like to gather to groups. And what Putnam was arguing in his book, Bowling Alone, was that maybe some of those social ties are coming undone. So, are we bowling alone? Or if we're not bowling alone, who are we bowling with? Are we bowling with our friends? And if we are, who are our friends? And how is a friend different from an acquaintance? So what is a friend? So you ask a teenager, what's a friend? And a teenager might say, well, my friends are the people I like to hang out with, right? If you talk to adults, they might say, my friends are people who share my tastes and my interests. Sometimes we uh, talk about our friends in terms of the settings where we have friendship. So for example, we talk about my friends at work. Or if you live in Wisconsin, uh, people talk about my friends at the lake, right? Um, these are friendships based on, um, uh, you know, doing things together that we enjoy. Uh, today, uh, in terms of social networking, people talk about my Facebook friends or my Twitter friends. But a common thread through all of these is some kind of sense of connectedness, that we have a network of people who we like and enjoy, and we hope they like and enjoy us. So if you probe a little bit deeper and ask people, well, what's a true friend? Well, most of the time you'll get some kind of an answer that says something like, a true friend is a person who will be there for me when I need him or her. A person who will be there for me. So, so we're moving beyond this kind of casual connection to talk about loyalty, to talk about commitment, because our lives have become intertwined in a manner 
that permits friends to have meaningful expectations of one another. And throughout our lives, these kinds of friendships knit together and sometimes, for a whole variety of reasons, friendships also end. Now for older people, of course, the greatest and most painful disruption of friendship is the final one, when the friend dies. And I have had many experiences, and you perhaps have also, of talking with older people who say to me that everyone they were ever close to is gone. These are sometimes people in their 90s whose adult children have died and their friends, and their siblings, and the people they grew up with, etc. Now, because human beings are fundamentally relational, many of these same elders form relationships with fellow residents. Say you're talking about people in a nursing home. So they'll tell you that these friendships aren't the same as the ones they've had with persons their whole lives. And, and, and some of them will also tell you that they hesitate to form friendships in, say, assisted living or um, skilled nursing because they know that death haunts even the most progressive facility. But if you spend a little bit more time there, you'll see a lot of evidence of people caring for each other. People check on each other's welfare. They greet one another in the hallways. They sit together at mealtimes and in activities. And they worry when someone's health declines. And they worry when they see the ambulance pulled up in front of the facility. They argue about things. And they joke and laugh together. In some facilities, in some of those facilities that we call continuum of care retirement communities, CCRCs, um, in some of those places, dementia can be a major challenge to social networks. We have a group of people who usually live in the independent living section who might label themselves the well elderly. And sometimes they actively avoid people with memory loss for a variety of reasons. I went to a, um, uh, I visited an adult day center one time in New Jersey. Uh, that had programs for people in that category of mild cognitive impairment, and it also had programs in the category of people who had been diagnosed with dementia, Alzheimer's disease or other dementias. And this facility had two separate entrances because the people with mild cognitive impairment didn't want to have any contact with the people who were further along the dementia road. This is a topic that elicits a lot of fear and anxiety, as I will point out to you later. Um, and so we see this in these uh, CCRCs, uh, because they just don't want to be reminded. Perhaps they're having their own bouts of forgetfulness, and they really don't want to think about it. There are lots of ways that we can think about who stays in friendship over a long time. Who becomes a friend in late life? You know, we can make friends even in late life. And whose friendship can no longer be sustained? But because dementia is defined as progressive forgetfulness, by necessity, it brings change to friendship. Whether or not that friendship has lasted a long time or it's newly formed. Dementia brings change to friendship. So now I want to take us a little bit deeper into this, if you can stand that on a Tuesday afternoon. I want to take us to Aristotle. OK? Aristotle wrote about a lot of things, but one of the things he wrote about was friendship. In his Nicomachean Ethics, he wrote about friendship. And he used the Greek word philia which is a broader term than our word friendship. Philia refers to all familiar acquaintances, so it can be a continuum from people who are really close to us, or even our family members, to people who are business associates. And Aristotle, being Aristotle and liking to categorize things, he broke friendship into three categories. He talked about friendships based on utility, 
friendships based on pleasure and friendships based on virtue. The friendships based on utility have the quality of a business relationship. What can this person offer to me and what must I return give back to that person? And when such a friendship no longer serves my purpose or no longer serves the other purpose, then it may be easily abandoned. And that's why Aristotle called it an incomplete friendship. I think you know about these kinds of friendships. They can be perfectly fine and perfectly useful. But when we are no longer in connection with these people, we stop having the friendship. Perhaps these people move on to our holiday card list. Okay? And then after a while, we start to check. Oh, am I still hearing from that person? I haven't heard from that person for a few years. Eh, off the list. Okay. Um, so Aristotle also defined friendships based on pleasure. But they too are complete, incomplete, rather. These are friendships that are celebrated in the beer advertisements that make me crazy. Um, uh, you know, everybody hanging out, rooting for the same sports team, right? Um, uh, or these are friendships based, uh, you know, in, again, in the advertising world because we all buy the same stuff. Um, or we have the same political views, or we make jokes about the same things, or whatever it is. Um, we certainly enjoy being together, but there can be an element of narcissism in these friendships, because after all, we're looking for people who are just like us. Okay? And they too are incomplete in Aristotle's thinking. In his view, a friendship is complete when it, when it shares elements of these other two. So we don't want to give up the fact that we can do things for one another, and we don't want to give up the fact that we enjoy being together. But for Aristotle, the primary center for the complete friendship is in virtue. And what he means by that is that true friends support each other in living good and ethical lives. And he described five characteristics of these types of friendships. So as I work through these five characteristics, think about your own friendships, your own friendships that you would call true friendships. We wish good for our friends, and we seek to do good on their behalf. All right? We want good for our friends. And when possible, <clears throat> We do good for them. We want our friends to continue to exist and we'll do what is in our power to guard and protect them. Now this might have a bit of a hint of paternalism in it, but I think, I can, I think we can kind of uh, lay this out in a thoughtful way. For our friends with dementia who have started down that road of progressive forgetfulness, we want them to continue to exist. We want them to live well. And we'll do what is in our power to guard and protect them. And sometimes that, that might mean saying, you know, have you thought about perhaps talking to your doctor about these memory problems? That's a very hard thing to say, isn't it? Very hard. But then you can follow that up and say, I want you to know I'm with you. No matter what you hear from your doctor, I'm with you. Um, uh, and, and, and what else can be done here? Well, I think that this is the place where we can start to talk about advocacy. We can say, not only does friendship mean that we enjoy being together and that I'm looking out for the good in your life, but also that I'm going to stand up for you. I'm going to stand up for you in a way to try to make a community that is welcoming to you, and that does not exclude you, like what happened to that woman and her husband on the bowling league. We commit to spending time with our friends. This is hard in the 21st century for a lot of people. Everybody's lives are so scheduled and overscheduled. You know, um, when was the last time somebody just dropped in to see you? 
just kind of showed up at the door and you said, oh, come on in, let's sit down and have a cup of tea. You know, we, we, we schedule these things, don't we? Um, and when a friend has dementia, the same should hold. We should commit to spending time with that friend. Or if we don't, six months will go by and we won't have been in contact. So we commit to spending time with our friends. We share with our friends common choices and decisions centered in the effort to live virtuous lives. So this means that within community, we're trying to live a good life together. So we commit to that. We share with this choices about how we can live a good life together. And lastly, we share in our friends' joys and sorrows. Now, it's not so hard to share in your friends' joys, although I must say that sometimes that is hard when you are envious of the friend's joy. But most of the time, we don't have too much trouble sharing in our friends' joys. But it's hard sometimes to share in our friends' sorrows. And some of you might know people who, who say, I can't visit in hospitals. I just can't do that. Or I, I can't go to funerals. Um, I can't go to nursing homes. Right? Um, it's hard to share in people's joys sometimes as well as in their sorrows. But Aristotle in his teachings about friendship said that true friendship binds us together in sickness and in health, for better or for worse. I think some of you may have heard that phrase somewhere before. So inevitably, as we all share this journey of aging, some of the friends we cherish, or we ourselves, are going to begin the journey of dementia. And dementia can challenge the ways we have previously experienced and understood our friendship. So how do we continue to carry a portion of our friend's memory when our friend can't remember that anymore? Okay? And, and, and how do we, how do we um, uh, act as, as present to our friend when our friend may not remember our name and may not remember the last time we were together? So when somebody sets out on the dementia road, those incomplete friendships, those friendships based on utility and the ones based on pleasure, they likely come to an end in short order. Because as Aristotle repeatedly said, friendships based solely on utility assume that we'll engage in transactions that benefit us both. So the person living with dementia may be perceived as no longer having value. And likewise, friendships that are grounded only in pleasure may not endure when the friend with dementia no longer can engage with the kinds of activities and interests that we once held in common. And let me tell you, it doesn't always bring pleasure to share time with people with dementia, but it's important. One by one, the friendships that are based on utility and the friendships that are based on pleasure can fade away. And often people will say something that I hear all the time, and maybe some of you have heard this too. They say, I want to remember Joe as he was. Okay? I just want to remember Joe as he was. Joe has already left us. I would argue that is not true at all. But that is what we say out of our fear and our anxiety. So let's talk a bit about that. Because none of this is easy. We have a lot of fear. And we have a lot of anxiety. And it's understandable that we have this fear and this anxiety. Now let's talk a bit about what fear and anxiety are. Um, because we are together living in an age that is fraught with anxiety. Okay? 
Um, uh, in fact, um, Auden, if you know the poetry of Auden, you know, in 1949, proclaimed this the age of anxiety. Okay? Um, some of you uh, baby boom music lovers in the room will remember a song by The Who in which they said, I hope I die before I get old. Now there are some, there's so much fear. There's so much anxiety. Now fear is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, fear, as a matter of fact, can be a good thing. Um, because fear functions as an alarm system for us, right? You know, uh, fear says, oops, something dangerous ahead. You know, better you get out of the way or resist it. Fight or flight, you've probably all heard that uh, uh, statement before. Um, but, um, uh, so fear can mobilize our defenses. Um, as a matter of fact, if we have some occasions when we have some serious forgetfulness, the fear might just motivate us to go see the doctor, okay? So in that way, it can be a good thing. But if fear paralyzes us, if it immobilizes us, or if it puts us into a state of denial, then it's not adaptive. Okay? Now, anxiety is a little bit different from fear. Like fear, anxiety also makes us want to hide and avoid trouble. But unlike fear, which is elicited by something that's right there in front of us, anxiety's source is more opaque, it's more ambiguous. One way of thinking about this is that anxiety is experienced as anticipating something bad that might happen in the future, although its exact form is unclear. But fear is the response to the threat right now in front of us. And I think you can see how both of them function when we're talking about dementia. They have a lot of psychological sources, these fears and anxieties that we have about memory loss, forgetfulness, confusion. They have a lot of psychological sources, but they also have social sources. There is a lot of fear-mongering that is out there in our culture. I collect examples of fear-mongering. Uh, for example, I, 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 I get in my mail, you know, the junk mail, okay? And it's, um, uh, it, you know, I get requests for funding for things. And, 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 and when you get these requests, they state things in the most fear-provoking way possible, right? You know, oh, people are, you know, their brains and the things happening and all these people with dementia and send us money right now, okay? Um, uh, and and um, I don't know whether you know the work of Ann Basting. She's a wonderful friend of mine. She works uh, up at UW-Milwaukee. She heads the Center on Aging Community there. She has written a fabulous book that I highly recommend. It's very accessible. The name of her book is called Forget Memory. Forget Memory, isn't that wonderful? Um, and in this book, she documents this kind of social fear-mongering that is out there um, in literature and in film and on television shows and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and, and this fear has been growing through the 20th century, as Tom Cole argued. When, as we have begun to locate all meaning in the self, and not at all out in the community. In our time, in the 21st century, because of this fear and anxiety, dementia is what some authors have called a disease of exclusion. Okay, it excludes people. And I want to give you some quotes from people who I interviewed during my sabbatical research a year or so ago. I sat in people's homes and, and talked with them about, about dementia. And I, I was, um, my main question had to do with friendship and, and how they felt connected or disconnected from community. Here's some examples. This is a woman, I love this quote. She said, people don't want to talk about her diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, but they wouldn't mind asking me about having the flu. 
Here's another one. This one comes from a woman who I interviewed. Um, uh, she lived in a farmhouse over by Manitowoc, Sheboygan area. Um, she was caring for her father who had dementia. She had moved into the family farmhouse with her husband and children to care for her father so he could stay in the same place. And here's what she said. Friends don't come to visit her dad very much. I'm sure there are people who want to help, but they just don't know how to approach it. People don't call here much. They don't stop in as often. A disease of exclusion. And here's my last quote. This last one comes from a woman who was taking care of her husband. She said, our friends have just kind of moved on from us. We're not really chummy with our neighbors. I just don't want to burden people with my troubles. How many times have you heard that statement? All right. And yet remember what I said about true friends. We're there for one another in terms of having troubles. But we're so reluctant, aren't we? We're so reluctant. So what can we do? What can we do about all this? Well, I have some ideas. The first one is that we ought to talk with the people who are living with dementia about what they want from their friends. Now, I want you to notice the language that I'm using here. I'm talking about people living with dementia. Living with dementia, okay? That's important. And the other thing that I want you to notice about that is it's got a kind of ambiguity to it. So that if I am a wife taking care of my husband who has Alzheimer's disease, I am living with dementia, right? And so, and so I'm using that phrase to kind of broaden this, to have us think about the fact that in reality, we are all living with dementia. Okay? We're all living with it. So we should talk with people, particularly those who have the diagnosis and those who are in a care partnering relationship. What do they want from their friends? I, I, one of the interviews that I did, I talked to a woman who was caring for her husband and she said, you know, I wish somebody would just come by occasionally and take him fishing. I don't fish, I don't know how to fish, but if if somebody would just come by and take him fishing, okay? So asking people, what do they want from their friends? And then I think we need to teach people how to communicate with their friends with dementia. How, how to communicate with somebody with forgetfulness, somebody with confusion. It is possible, as a matter of fact, it can be quite enjoyable and it can be mutually shared. But there are certain things we need to know about how to communicate with our friends with dementia. And I don't think we're doing a good enough job of getting this word out. As I look at the literature on, on people in relationship to folks with dementia, the, the dominant part of the literature is just about family or paid caregivers. So you can find lots of books about family, how to communicate with people with dementia, paid staff, how to communicate with people with dementia. But when it comes to friends, not a whole lot, okay? We need to teach people this. And we need to encourage community organizations to be intentional about including persons with dementia. We need to encourage those bowling leagues to understand how they can include persons with dementia. We need to encourage the Rotary Club and the Lions Club and the, and you know, the, the sports group and the whatever. You know, all these wonderful organizations that de Tocqueville said Americans love so much, okay? We need to, we need to encourage these community organizations to be intentional about including persons with dementia because we do not want to reinforce this idea of exclusion and ostracism and stigma. And we want to do good for others together. People who have progressive forgetfulness 
continue to want to believe their lives have meaning. People who have dementia, whatever kind of dementia it is, want to feel like their lives have purpose. They want to feel like, like there's some reason for them to get up in the morning. They want to help others, right? And so we need to figure out how together we can do good for others and include our friends with dementia. There's some marvelous examples of this happening around the country right now. Um, and, and we just need to nurture this and talk about it more. Um, you know, we have in nursing homes, we have all kinds of activities for people. Well, some progressive nursing homes have service projects that residents are doing together. That's fabulous. Gives people a sense of purpose. And we want to remember the joy zones. And what I mean by that, and I'll return to this idea in, in a moment with my last slide, but, but I'll tell you what I mean by that right now. And that is that each one of us has some things in our lives that bring us joy, okay? And we ought to know about what brings joy to our friends so that if our friends have dementia, we might be able to bring some of that joy, right? And if we don't know about the joy zones, we're not going to know that, okay? As I say, I'll return to that. Hold that idea. I'll return to that. What else do we need? We need to work together to create what I call flourishing communities where all persons can experience meaningful aging today and in the future. Now you notice that I cleverly snuck in the title of my talk here, okay? Meaningful aging today and in the future. Um, we need to work together to create flourishing communities. Psychologists these days are talking about uh, human flourishing as a way of kind of getting away from talking about mental health and mental illness to get away from that kind of biomedical perspective, to talk about what does it make to, uh, so our lives can flourish, all right? So that's on an individual basis. But I'm posing this question of what can we do to make our communities flourish for all persons? Well, I think one thing, one step we all need to take is to recognize that every single one of us has vulnerabilities. We need to face up to our own vulnerabilities and stop pretending like we're super people, right? That we all have weaknesses, we all have vulnerabilities. And moreover, we need together to resist the idea that we are all autonomous, okay? And rather, we need to together figure out a way that we can embrace the idea that we live in interdependency, right? That we need one another. And, and, and when we start to talk about this, we can begin to move towards these flourishing communities. So now I want to show you my last slide. This is a story about one person's joy zones. This person happens to be a very highly regarded geriatrician in the Appleton area. And one day I was at a dementia care conference and, and she came, she was one of the speakers and she came rushing in um, and she was all kind of, you know, had 16 things going on, but she was there to give a talk and, and she paused and she took a deep breath and she said, I want to talk about joy zones. I want to talk about those things that I am certain will bring me joy even in the late stages of dementia, should I get dementia, right? Now here's a woman, she's a doctor, you know, she eats well, she reads, she drinks her red wine, she exercises, but she may have dementia someday. Remember I said a flourishing community is where we recognize all our vulnerabilities, including the possibility that any of us might experience memory loss. So she wants people to know about her joy zones because at some point in the dementia journey, we lose the ability to communicate, okay? Most of us lose the ability to, to speak or communicate clearly. So here's what hers are. 
baseball. Now, this is interesting. She said, I don't even really like baseball, but it's a joy zone for her. And what did she mean by that? She meant by that that she recalls the pleasure of so many summer days when she was growing up, when her dad had the baseball game on. It was on kind of in the background. And for her, the sound of, you know, Bob Duker or something in Milwaukee, uh, the, the sound of the, the, the radio broadcast of a baseball game, even though she doesn't really quite know much about baseball, gave her pleasure, okay? And so she said, you know, when you come to visit me in the nursing home, let's just sit and listen to a baseball game together. I might not follow it, but I'll be in my joy zone. And she said this too. Bring me some peonies. Um, uh, she said that she loves the odor of peonies and, the, and just the sight of peonies in the spring. Some of you may have peonies in your gardens that are, I don't know, mine haven't come up yet in Appleton, but maybe down here they have. Uh, but, but, but you know, she said this scent and this sight of peonies, that's her joy zone, okay? Maybe she won't be able to see so well anymore, but but maybe she'll be able to touch the flower, or maybe she'll be able to smell it. But in community with her friends, together, they will experience joy. And that is a nice description of virtuous friendship. Thank you. <laughs>